I worked at Mangrove Associates and the Lights of the Coast. They also have my own practice as well. That's what kind of in two different areas um, in the Cleveland area on the west side. I live in Mount Clear and I am myself a parent. I'm on the board here and I also have a three year old who also goes to Cleveland Smith with her first day. So he is one of my little guys who I just um, kind of pushed me into this. Um, process of thinking about growth mindset. I have four children, so my three-year-old my youngest, and my other three are typically developing. So what I mean by that is that I didn't really have any formal school. There weren't any things happening that was like, oh my goodness, what's happened here? Where are we going with this? There was nothing that was anything that made me um, worried or think about how I'm thinking about their progress. Okay. Michael came along, and at the time Michael's coming along, he has some hearing issues, his language is delayed, he doesn't want to name, things like that. Okay. And so he is, I call it, like, what are we doing? What are we doing? You know, kind of panic setting in for myself. And at the same time, my oldest was in second grade, and I walked into the second grade classroom, and all along the walls were these things like, you can do hard things, and, and Michael Jordan pictures over here about how you can shoot how many baskets, and you know, you make you miss, and you make them. And I'm like, what are we talking about? And there's also posters about growth mindset, okay? And so I said to Miss Hughes, you know, what, where are we going with this? And she said, well, I don't care if you make mistakes. I want them to grow from it. And that set the tone for Sally for the rest of the year. I thought that was a really important thing. And so as he's, my oldest has some troubles and frustration tolerance, like a lot of children do. And so I realized that I had to get on board this growth mindset way of thinking. Because just because Ms. Kelly or Ms. Hughes is doing it doesn't mean it's gonna filter in the home unless I understand it as well. And it also helped me think a little bit more about my childhood struggle. Okay? Because as a psychologist, I get data, I get numbers, and I think about them as something that's, that's real, that's tangible, that's healthy information. And if my numbers are below what I would like them to be, or what I would expect for a child at this age range, where do I go from there? Okay, so thinking about cognitive abilities. If I have my child who's falling in the lower cognitive range, what does that mean for him? Is there a way that he can progress? Is there a way that he can move forward? And growth mindset is saying, we can do whatever. Okay? Not like a pie in the sky kind of way, but like in a, if we put forth effort, if we build resilience, if we build persistence, if we put forth effort, we can make steps towards progress. We can make progress. Okay? So Carol Dweck was the psychologist who, who kind of thought about this and created this idea and, and identified it as something she was observing in her students. So she worked with at Columbia. And so she does a lot of research. All right? And so she realized that some kids, when presented with a challenge, they're excited about it. They want to do the challenge. Even if it's really hard and they can't quite get it, they're like, yeah, let's keep going, let's keep trying. And there's other kids where you give them a challenge, they put a little bit of effort in and it's like aversive. They don't want it anymore. Nope, not doing this. Okay? And they back off. And so she said, why do some kids, same age, same classroom, why do some kids persist and other kids just don't want anything to do with it? They back off. And so she coined the terms fixed mindset right here and then growth mindset. And what she identified about fixed mindset is that people who have a fixed mindset believe that what they have is what they have and you can't grow, nothing changes. So if you are only as smart as learning as you are right now, that's never gonna change, okay? If you only have this amount of artistic ability, no matter what you do, it's never gonna get any better. If you can't make baskets now in basketball, you're never going to get any better. Those kids have the talent. I don't. Okay? Similarly, if I'm a third grade basketball star, then I'm a third grade basketball star and it's effortless for me. Okay? And if something is a little bit challenging for me, then I don't want to show everybody that I'm not really as good as they think I am. If I miss a shot, then that's a sign of my failure. Okay? So in a fixed mindset, success and failure walk a very thin line. Okay? So I'm successful over here, but suddenly I'm making a mistake and now I'm failing. For them, everything is an evaluation. Every time I raise my hand and speak in class, every time I go out onto a basketball court, every time I draw a picture, it's a chance for someone to judge me. And so I'm going to stay away from things that I'm not that, that I don't feel that competent in because it's a sign that I don't have the talent in this. And everyone will know that. Okay? Effort and failure are aversive for people who have a fixed mindset. The effort, um, there's this idea that people, we'll talk about it in a second, that some people just can do that. Some people just have the intelligence to be able to do math facts 
as fast as they possibly can in third grade. All right, like zoom through math, they're just so good at math, okay? But if they have to actually work at it, it means they're not that smart, which isn't true, right? So whenever we've all learned something, if you, if you learned a new position in your job, you made mistakes and you learned and you kept growing and you kept learning and trying and putting forth effort because as adults, we realize that just because you make a mistake doesn't mean that you're not able to do X, Y, Z in your job, okay? But as kids, whenever we receive grades, whenever we are uh, given the message that you come home with A's and anything less is unacceptable, then effort is going to be somewhat aversive. And that mistake is going to be a sign that someone's going to be mad at you, okay? So fixed mindset is easy for us to fall into. All right, so it's something that we all do from time to time, uh, some of us more than others. I am admittedly, personally, someone who falls into fixed mindset frequently. Okay, so I have to check myself frequently for areas of growth. I realize that in some of my very sad times with my kids have been times when I've been in a fixed mindset about the future. Okay, so whenever we think of ourselves in a fixed mindset, we have to kind of pull ourselves back and say, is it true that I can't go anywhere with this if I don't put in effort, build resilience, and persevere? Because we want to send that message to our kids as well. So the, the other part of this, the flip side of it, is the growth mindset. People who have a growth mindset think that talent, skills, intelligence can be cultivated. So that we are being put into opportunities for us to make mistakes and to grow and be supported in those times, then we will be successful in whatever goal it is that we've set, okay? If you were to ask anyone who's ever been truly successful in their field, they would say that their innate talent, the thing they were born with, accounted for 10% of it, the rest of it's hard work. If you have built yourself up to a place where you are currently, you know that you were not born with the skills you have as an adult, right? We weren't born to be able to do whatever job it is that we have now. We worked really hard to get there. We weren't born to be parents to the kids that we have now. We worked really hard to get here, okay? So effort is growth. Innate skills don't count for much, and that practice is necessary to achieve, all right? You have to push yourself, so that's that persistence piece. Growth mindset really does tie in hard work, effort, resilience, and persistence. So it's easy for us to fall into growth mindset because we really do value effortlessness. So I put some names up here of people that frequently are thought of as being um, just kind of naturally talented in whatever work they did, all right? So Edison. He's in the book, in mean, one of the books that she gave him as an example. And I thought that was an interesting example because if you think about Edison, the guy who invented the light bulb, you think of him like in a basement with like light bulbs working on stuff, you know, by himself just working and all the times he failed. He had hundreds of people who worked for him and created things for him. Okay? He didn't work by himself. He worked with teams of people. He worked with other inventors. He worked with people supporting him. Okay, Michelangelo, they have an exhibit down at the, the, the Museum of Art right now for Michelangelo's drawings. And what I thought about him that I didn't even realize, so I was putting this presentation together when I went and saw it, and that it's all just drawings of tiny parts of things that he did in a greater scheme. All right, so the Sistine Chapel, there's just picture after picture of feet. All right, he drew every foot that he then painted over and over and over again. So this person that we think of is just going and like painting something on the ceiling, practiced every day over and over and over again. Okay, Elon Musk. He's one of the most famous people that we have around right now, one of the biggest minds. And he has so many things that fail. Okay? He has spaceships that blew up. Okay? He fails and he still keeps going. Emily Blunt, she's an actress, and she apparently had a severe stutter from the age of seven to about 14, where she didn't talk to anybody for a very long time. And now she's an actress. She kept persevering. Okay? She put forth the effort. Venus and Serena Williams, Michelle Obama, these are people who worked really hard to get from a place where they where they were born, okay? So born into, you know, a family where the dad liked tennis, born into a family that really wanted to see her achieve things. And they supported them and they encouraged them and they failed and they keep going, they kept going. And then uh, a more free, recent figure, Greta Thunberg, okay? So she's a young woman with Asperger's who has overcome some pretty significant difficulties to be a pretty well-known person who's really driving change and things that she thinks are important. Okay? These are people where it seems effortless whenever you kind of look at them doing it. Oh, look at her. She's just in front of the UN. She sat outside a building for a year. Okay? She put in the time. They put in the work and the effort to get to where it seems effortless. But they probably wouldn't say they did it effortlessly. The other piece of a fixed mindset is that our society also values a fast pace. 
Okay? We value the idea that if you do something fast, it means you're right. Okay, so think about like your math facts. You have kids in elementary school right now. Math facts are the most easiest one to pick out. You need to complete these 20 math addition facts in one minute or whatever it is. Okay, and if you can't do that, you have to keep practicing. You have to keep practicing. Because the idea is that if you are good at your math facts and you're able to, it'll make it easier for you to do more complex math problems, which I totally understand and agree with. But then also this idea, if you were to ask questions to the kids who were sitting in the classroom doing it, the kids who get it done quickly are smart. And the kids who take longer are not smart. Okay? We send the idea, if a kid does something really quick, they'll say, wow, you did that really quick. You're pretty smart. Okay? We say this without even thinking about it. That was fast. You're smart. Okay? This fast pace is the opposite of a growth mindset. Growth mindset means you learn. It means you immerse yourself in the learning process. You make mistakes and you grow from it. If you move through something really fast, it means it was too easy for you. Can't grow from it. Something that we see with some of our kids who academic come easy for. Alright? So they're able to zoom through grade level stuff. The minute you give them something that's slightly harder, then we start seeing pushback. Because they don't have to learn to be resilient. They don't have to learn to persevere. Okay? Some of our kids where it's harder for them, they are frequently visit visiting that perseverance place. Okay, so if it's harder for you to read, some of the kids I've seen who have some reading difficulties, they will read a book for like a half an hour and they will just keep going and going and going and sounding it out and trying and trying. Oh my goodness, the perseverance on that child. Okay, I would argue that's a really good skill to have. Okay, so we have to think about what does our society value? What do we value as parents? And sometimes we have to check our kids if they're pushing something that in the end, would we rather have it be a child who's willing to put forth the work, or a child who pushes back whenever things get a little bit tough. Okay, so we have to think about that. So the trouble with fixed mindset is that it results in decreased effort. Okay, the minute I see something that's harder, I'm gonna push back, I'm not gonna put forth the effort. Because the mental strain that comes in, think about a time that you learned something that was confusing to you. And you felt like your brain was like gonna explode or melt or something, okay? Part of growth mindset is teaching kids the idea, we'll talk about it in a second. That every time you learn something new, your neurons connect. Okay? And so that strain that you feel is your neurons connecting in your brain. Okay, so they're stretching, stretching, stretching. And then if you practice and practice, it becomes easier for you to think about it because those neurons they form stronger bonds, become a bigger rope kind of connecting them. Okay? So that stretching that you feel is your brain growing in a way that we tell kids about it. Okay? So that discomfort that you feel whenever you're learning something new and it's hard is your brain growing and stretching. Okay? And the only way to make it easier and to relieve that discomfort is to keep practicing and to persevere and to keep going with it. Okay? A child who doesn't know that, a child who doesn't think about this in a positive light, that the practice makes you, makes you grow stronger, practices that, right, that brain muscle, will feel it as something that's immersive and they want to stop that discomfort feeling. Okay? So we see kids with fixed mindset having a fear of failure. They have strong negative reactions to even slight, tiny mistakes because, again, they feel like that's a judgment. Remember back when we were talking about the judgments? Strong negative reactions to effort because, remember, effortlessness is valued. Right? You just did that. That's amazing. So if I put forth effort, the opposite of that means that it wasn't something that came naturally to me, which means I'm not that great at it. Low frustration tolerance. So the minute it's frustrating, they're kind of pushing off. They're done. And their self-esteem is fragile. Remember we talked about how it's a fine line between success and failure for some of our kids with a fixed mindset? So if I get an A on this one, things are great. I feel really great about myself. I got a B the next time. I'm not good at this. I can't do this. This doesn't work. So self-esteem is variable. Okay? Benefits of growth mindset. Whenever we help a child think about um, persistence and hard work and resiliency, we get a willingness to try. Okay? Perseverance. An appreciation for problem solving, and then relatively stable self-esteem. So, the growth mindset has been a bit of a movement in education that happened. Um, like I said, you know, when my son was in second grade, so it was a couple years ago is whenever it really started digging up for me, but it's probably been about five, six years that this has been something that's really gone on. Carol Black wrote the book in 2006. And it's possible for a really good idea to get boiled down to a place where it doesn't mean anything anymore. Okay? And so for some people, when you hear about growth mindset, it can get boiled down into the very smallest part of it, which is praise them for effort. Okay? 
And so if we just praise someone for effort, someone might say we're doing growth mindset. Okay, we'll talk about the steps for it in a second. But what it might look like in a school setting is you might see inspirational quotes on the wall. You might see them reviewing that, that basic neuroscience piece I was telling you about with the neurons. And you might see them reinforcing efforts to the grades, the praising efforts to the grades. An interesting piece of it related to the study that looked at a fixed versus growth mindset in kindergartners. Okay? And what she found was that in a group of sample of kids in like Virginia, 0% of kids in kindergarten had a fixed mindset. They all had a growth mindset. They all felt like, oh, we can do anything. We can come in here and learn. This is great. In kinder, in first grade, ten percent had a fixed mindset. In second grade, eighteen percent had a fixed mindset. In third grade, forty-two percent had a fixed mindset. And so when you're talking about why is that, it's because as we go through school, we start to see that I'm not getting something as well as this person. Okay? We start to hear those implicit messages that this person did something fast, but I did it slow, so they're better than me. Okay? We start to be praised back that maybe aren't what we think aren't valued by our parents, aren't valued by your teacher, okay? Our papers don't get hung up on the wall because we didn't get the A's, okay? So without intervention and shift in school at home, we see that increase in mindset, in fixed mindset happening as kids get older, okay? It's much easier to keep a kid in growth mindset than it is to take a kid in fixed mindset and shove them into a growth mindset, but it's possible, okay? So whenever we just do these things, it can easily become false growth mindset. False growth mindset is a problem. Because, say you have a child who has a science test, okay? And the kid tries really hard and they still fail the science test. You say, wow, he put forth some really good effort on that. That was amazing how much effort he put on that. That's false growth mindset. And the reason is because the kid still failed. And you didn't acknowledge it. So then they feel kind of helpless about it. Like, I put forth all this effort and I still failed. The outcome isn't what I wanted, all right? And so what you have to do, we'll talk about this in a second, is acknowledge the failure, praise the effort, and then realize where they're at and make steps to get to where they're at, to where you want them to be. So you acknowledge current levels, acknowledge the failure, praise the effort, praise the strategy, praise the problem solving, <laughs> and then set goals and steps to get them to where you want them to be, or to where they want to be, okay? So it's not just a matter of like, growth mindset isn't just, hey, great job, great effort. Oh my goodness, so you worked so hard on that. It's, that was really good effort. It's super disappointing that you didn't quite get where you wanted to be. So let's take a look at the questions that we got wrong. Let's work our way through it. Let's try to figure out where the problems are, okay? And so we'll run through some scenarios to help you kind of implement this in a little bit, okay? So what we actually need to do is actually value the process of learning and not the product. That is not a revelation, right? And so I'm not saying anything you don't already know. We have to actually value the process of learning and not the product. So, how many of you have elementary school kids in here? Okay. How many of you get upset if there's less than an A on something? Okay, I do. So if there's less than an A, I'll be like, old me. So let's talk about me like a year ago. What happened? You must have not been trying. You didn't try, did you? You zoomed through. My oldest, his teachers always say they zoom through all this work. You zoom through all this. Did you zoom through? No, I didn't zoom through. Okay, so suddenly, I'm telling him, you can do great things, you can do hard things, look, look, yeah, blah, 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 he brings up anything less than an A and I'm focused on the problems and the product and everything like that, okay? While not acknowledging that mistakes are a way of learning, okay? That we only learn, we learn best from things that we do wrong, all right? You can probably think of something that you've done wrong over the course of your career, and you'll never forget it because you learn the most from it, okay? So, value the process of learning and not the product. And this doesn't just go for parents, it goes for teachers too, and educators, and everyone involved in the, the child's life. So, currently, wonderful teacher, fantastic teacher. He's an, he's an amazing teacher for my, for my oldest child. And my oldest child um, was very upset because his paper was not hung on the wall with the A papers. Like thinking about it as I'm making this presentation, like the A papers get hung on the wall. Only the A papers. Not the papers where the kid put in a whole lot of work. Not the papers where the kids made the most growth. The A papers. So even if we're praising effort, even if we're putting forth hard work, our action shows, you know what? Getting it all right is what I want to see. Okay? And there's a place for that to a certain extent. There's also needs to be a place for valuing the improvement. 
because then we're putting kids into a fixed mindset, all right? So no matter what, even if I put forth the effort, if I get less than a B, it doesn't really matter. No one cares if I did it. No one cares about the effort. There's no point in me trying the A papers to put up, okay? We have to also recognize that setbacks will occur. Even if you push yourself into a fixed mindset or a growth mindset frequently, there are triggers that put you into a fixed mindset. Okay, so for me it's grades. Grades will trigger me to go with a fixed mindset. More at the moment. Okay, um, for other people, and I, I have to catch myself, so my daughter, she's four, she's the youngest in her ballet class. My goodness, these little girls are, she's turning five, she's turning five today. So the other girls are almost six. Okay, they said she'll go in five girl class. And I'm like, yeah, that's like a wackadoo, okay? And so they're all standing there doing their ballet stuff, looking super cute. And she's imitating someone. She's walking like this. And the ballet teacher's like, hand it back to the bar. Hand it back to the bar. And I'm like, she's just not good at this. And she's four, okay? So how often do you think that? You put your kid onto a basketball program. He's just not good at this, okay? <laughs> Why? Why? You know? Um, I used to sarcastically say to my nine-year-old, um, whenever he would come home, I'm like, oh my goodness, this kid makes all the baskets. He makes all the baskets. I'm like, I hope he doesn't peak too early, because he's eight, okay? So, I kind of feel that way, you know? It's like, okay, so maybe that kid's putting forth the effort. Maybe he's putting forth the practice. Maybe he is. You're not really at this point in time. So, even though he's out there making all those baskets, he probably puts in a lot of practice, right? And we don't, it doesn't matter what you're doing now at eight. What matters is what you're doing as you get older. The skills that you're learning from basketball, the skills that you're learning from ballet, I put her in there because she doesn't focus. So this is a good place for her to learn the focus, okay? So we have to understand that we will be triggered to go back into fixed mindset. We can't live in growth mindset all the time because it's not possible. We frequently do have thoughts of, she's not good at that. That's my reader, he's my math guy. Those kind of things, those labels will pop into our head and we just need to kind of catch ourselves and say, let's pull ourselves back, okay? So, a note of caution about growth mindset. And, you know, Carol, everyone dove headfirst into this. And one of the things, at least in the education field, people just dove right in. But one of the things that kind of got kicked back was that there are things that are outside of kids' control, okay? SES, resources, racism, oppression, stereotypes, cultural insensitivity, okay? If I keep telling someone they can work hard and they'll get anything, um, there's a, a, a larger theory called the myth of meritocracy. And if you just do something, you try really hard to pull yourself up, okay? But if you live in a system in which there are some oppressive parts and racist parts and things like that, no matter what effort you put in, you may not get the outcome that you expect. And so do not acknowledge that to a child, okay? So say there's a, a child who's in a, um, I'm in a relatively affluent suburb, my child compared to another child who's in a, a suburb that doesn't have many resources, okay? My child's putting forth a whole lot of effort and it's all kinds of things happen. That child puts forth the same amount of effort, does he make the same progress? I don't know. But to recognize that he doesn't have the same resources to that child helps him not feel learned helplessness. Okay? So if I put forth the effort and I don't make the progress, I'm going to stop putting forth the effort because I'm not getting anywhere. Okay? And so that pushback that was coming from some of our more culturally sensitive psychologists were saying you have to acknowledge the external forces that do push down on families, that do push down on the kids that we're working with. In the same token, it's still helpful. Stereotypes and low expectations are easily triggered. You guys can probably think back to your Psych 101 days if you were in college, where they talked about how if you put a woman in a math class or a girl in a math class with a bunch of boys, she's going to automatically score lower than math than if she was in a room full of girls, okay? Because of stereotype that girls don't do math, okay? Even if that girl can think it, it still triggers her, and she still responds in a way that results in lower scores. Same with kids who are African American, black, different um, minority, all of those stereotypes that are put onto those kids will be triggered if they are in situations um, such as standardized testing. So you have a black kid in a room full of white boys and they're in standardized testing, that child will probably score lower than if they were not in that room taking that standardized test, taking it somewhere else, okay? So recognizing that these stereotypes can be triggered easily and then teaching and acknowledging it and teaching the child that you are in charge of your thoughts, okay? You are in charge of your thoughts. That if you take on your personal success while acknowledging that there are systems that might hold you back, okay? 
right? If you take on your personal success and you put forth your effort, then you can kind of push past those stereotypes that might odd, like subconsciously make you perform less, okay? So, I've been talking quite a bit, and you guys are probably like, yeah, I know all this. Because if you have a child who struggles, I feel like parents of kids who struggle are very, very familiar with growth mindset already. You may just not realize it, okay? So for me, yet is my favorite qualifier with my youngest one, okay? He's not saying hi to his friends yet. He will, okay? That yet means it's coming. I don't know when, I don't know where, I don't know who, but it's gonna come. And that yet puts us into a better mind space, okay? He's not saying hi to his friends, makes me feel like, mm. he's not saying hi to his friends yet is a great qualifier, okay? We are very familiar as parents of kids who struggle with differences, being told by all kinds of people that your kid has differences, okay? That your child's, where their growth trajectory is, when they're taking ups and downs. We have to look for ways to help our child make progress, okay? And we already have to focus on progress, we already do focus on progress instead of comparing others. It's important to think about how growth mindset isn't just like catchphrases, okay? It's not just praise. It's knowing, like believing, that learning and success require hard work and helping our kids develop the resilience and perseverance to push through, okay? So it's really not just being like, oh, good praise, good praise, and oh, just big happy thoughts. It's knowing that there's gonna be hard work ahead for them and helping them get there, okay? So we have to first push ourselves to change our mindset. We are the environment for our kids. Their teachers are the environment for their kids. We have to do some of the heavy lifting. Okay? We have to monitor our own self-statements and reframe towards growth. Hannah in ballet class, oh, she's not good at this, to she's four, let's give her a chance. Okay? Um, valuing improvement, really valuing improvement. Knowing that if I have a kid in front of me who doesn't spell the word the correctly five times, so he's spelling it T-T-E, T-T-E, T-T-E. Even if he doesn't spell any other word, if he suddenly spells T-A-G, Oh, that's cause for celebration, right? My goodness, you've been working so hard on spelling that, and look, you got it. Even if you got nothing else right on that paper, okay? Valuing the improvement, monitoring in your own head where are the areas that need to happen for growth, and then any tiny step forward being just there to cheerlead. Making statements and behaving in ways that demonstrate a value of hard work and making mistakes. What I mean by this is not letting a kid just skate by. Okay, so if your kid is doing something and it's easy for them, okay, and say your kid doesn't have any other places that they need to, to grow, so we're talking about more of a typical child who might be just skating through, all right? Instead of, wow, you did that so fast, that's amazing. Oh, I'm sorry, you did that really fast. I'm sorry I wasted your time. It's just something a little more challenging, okay? So taking that easy homework and flipping it. So. I use personal experiences because I don't want to talk about clients that I work with, okay? So my nine-year-old does his math homework on the bus, okay? Comes home, he's done, math homework's on the bus, whatever. Okay, fine, okay? He wasn't doing the challenge question. Why aren't you doing the challenge question? Mr. Justin said I don't have to do the challenge question. Oh, did he? He said you don't have to do it. Yeah, yeah. Did he say you don't have to do it or you just don't want to do it? Well, it's hard. Do the challenge question. Okay, and so that's the important piece of like pushing through. If you can do something on the bus and all the craziness that happens on the bus, it's way too easy for you. And I don't want to hear the frustration that happens whenever something hard comes along. So we're going to do the challenge question, and I'll sit with you and help you through it. Okay, so we need to have times making, putting forth that value of, okay, we're going to do the challenge question because I value you putting forth good effort. And I'll support you in this moment, I'll support you while we're doing this, and we'll walk through it together, but you're going to do it, all right? Looking for those opportunities to be able to push a little bit forward in a comfort zone you know your child's in. So you probably know the zones of proximal development, right? So you probably know, like, your child's here, and here's this goal, and then you kind of stretch a little bit further over here. You don't want to make the goal like, okay, so you just did this math homework, and this challenge question, so I'm going to give you a whole other sheet of math. That's not what I want to do, that's going to cause a fuss but just that one extra piece that can push and can tolerate that for five, 10 minutes of just brain stretching and making your brain connect. 
Just that tiny zone of proximal development, if you make one tiny jump, is going to be helpful in continuing to make tiny jumps forward. Okay? Continuing to stretch that resilience, that perseverance. Okay? Because what's he learning from homework that he can do that? Not much. Okay? There's nothing morally building about that homework. Okay? And we also have to let go of the scores and achievements to keep the process in one mind. And this is hard. Okay? Because we tie so much to what these scores mean. We tie so much to what these achievements mean. Okay? We think that, you know, if a kid doesn't do well in this grade, then this means he's not going to do well in this grade. Or if he doesn't do well here, then he's not going to get into this thing. We tie it all together. And keeping in mind, what's the end goal? If the end goal is to raise a successful adult, okay, then this doesn't really matter too much. Okay? What matters is perseverance, effort, resilience, learning the material, not being able to regurgitate it super quickly. <laughs> okay? So parenting from a growth mindset. So these are some steps that you can take. All right? Um, these slides are online, by the way, so you guys will have access to those. Okay? Um, give feedback-oriented praise. So growth mindset does have praise in it, but it's not just, hey, you did a great job, or oh, that was really great. Or, oh, awesome, fantastic, hard work, awesome. It's effort praise, strategy praise, persistence praise. So effort is praising the effort. You are really hard on that. Right? I really noticed how hard you put it into that. Strategy praise is, I like how you ask for help. That's a good strategy to figure out something whenever you have a hard time with something, you ask for help, that was amazing. I saw you trying to work it out with using the number line instead of dabbing with your fingers. That's a really good strategy for adding, okay? So you're focusing on the strategy that you see the kid using, okay? And then persistence praise is sticking with it. Okay, so praising that stick to it in this. The key here is this praise needs to be given before the kid reaches a level of frustration that shuts them off to your praise. All right? So we're going to talk about it in a second, the meltdown curve. Okay, so if we are at the top of the meltdown curve, no amount of praise or feedback or anything is going to pull your kid back. That's not going to happen. Okay, however, if we can see them like right on this upward slope, like they're just starting to get a little bit, stepping in and being like, Mom, you're really working very hard on that. Do you want to go take a break for a second and then come back? So knowing when your child's triggers are, knowing what your child's trigger signs are, and then stepping in to kind of give that praise, that feedback, that strategy, Deflecting for a second and coming back. Okay? No one does anything well when they're all the way up here. No strategy is going to work when we're all the way up here for us or for them. Okay? So we'll talk about that a little more in a second. But this feedback oriented praise is something that you've probably changed a shift towards the effort, but that strategy and the persistence is also very useful. Okay? Moving from labeling to acknowledging and promoting. So instead of, oh, you're so smart. To acknowledging you're taught the fourth lot of effort and then promoting it. I really like how you did that. Why don't we try that again next time? Okay? When success occurs, ask about it and reinforce the process. We frequently let success go. Okay? We frequently are like, oh, that was good. Okay, fantastic. Keep moving. Okay? But we need to stop and then see what worked. Okay? So you made a basket today. That was fantastic that you made a basket of basketball. So what did you do different this time? What was what's going on? What happened? Okay? And talk through it. Talking through, oh, well, you stopped and you looked around and you held your hands like this and they threw the ball and you looked at it and you hit, you hit the square around it like the coach told you to. Amazing. Okay? Fantastic. Um, when failure occurs, ask about and reinforce the process after the kid is down here. Okay, so if a kid fails and is up here, and I have a scenario that we'll talk about in a second, and they're up here, that's not the time to be like, oh, so what do you think went wrong? Uh -huh. Okay, because that's not going to work, and you're going to have like, a very angry child. Okay, so when failure occurs, you do need to come back and say, what do you think happened? But not in a way that I do sometimes, which is what happened, all right? It has to be in an actual wanting to know the answer. Okay? Sometimes when we say these things like, what happened? You did We're more expressing our own anger and frustration in the situation and not actually looking for answers. Okay? So really remembering valuing the process of learning and not just valuing the product. So what happened? What happened? Let's talk through this. Okay? Um, reference basic neuroscience and learning. This is a hard one for me to do as a parent. It's much easier for me to do as a psychologist. Okay? 
But as a parent, referencing that basic neuroscience, if you know that frustration, that, that feeling that you have in your brain that like, feels like it's hurting when I really do, that's actually your brain making new connections. And these are really, really important things for us to do. So whenever it feels uncomfortable, you want to bail, but you don't. Don't bail, because you want that connection. <coughs> and that connection, every time you practice it, it keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And eventually, that uncomfortable feeling will just be gone. Okay? And someone will say two plus two, and you'll say four, and there won't be any of this like tension that happens. Okay? It's easy to talk about whenever a child is calm. That is not a conversation to have when a child is frustrated. Okay, starting off about neuroscience. And also, one of the other things that you want to kind of keep in mind with all of this, and something I frequently tell people I work with, is as parents, we have to be super sneaky about all of the things that we're trying to help our child do frequently. Okay? So if I sit down and say, let's work on our coping skills. My kids are out the door, right? And they're like, no, that's not gonna happen. You have to be super sneaky about your coping skill development, about your helping them move towards a growth mindset. Some people do teach people about growth mindsets. I'm of the camp of we set the tone. So if our tone is a growth mindset tone, then our child will pick up that growth mindset tone. I don't need to sit down and be like, you know what? We're all shifting our mindsets here. Okay? <laughs> so we can move and, and, and help shape our kids' thinking just through our everyday interactions with them. Okay? And then allow opportunities to develop resil resilience and perseverance. Not being afraid of failure. Okay, so one of the things they reference in the book that's something to think about is that when your kids started walking, you probably weren't like, oh my goodness, what if she falls down? Okay? You probably were a little bit, but you knew that it was necessary to the point of walking. You didn't think they would just stand up and be like completely good at walking. Okay? Same with talking. Your kid may have had like a, a little bit of like a, a TH instead of an F. You probably weren't like, oh my goodness, what if she never says it right? Okay? You probably knew it was going to come, all right? Nine times out of ten, your kid's going to start saying that appropriately, and it will be okay. Same thing with everything else. There's going to be times when a kid fails, and that's just part of getting older <coughs> and growing up and learning things. And so for us to put it into the context of, yes, this is a part of learning, this is a part of growing, I expect you not to get A's. I expect you to try hard. I expect you to fail. And that's okay. Okay? You learn more in that way as well as setting goals, short-term and long-term, that are motivating to your child. So to practice this resilience, if you have a child who's really, really struggling with that resilience piece and that perseverance, finding something that they enjoy and setting goals in it. So <laughs> letting school go if school's the hot spot. You know, so if school's a trigger, then we're gonna, you're gonna do your thing at school, but we're gonna work on the growth mindset stuff here with our model cars. Okay, so I have a little guy who really likes cars, and he it has great fine motor skills, okay? <coughs> So buying increasingly difficult model cars is something that his parents and I have been talking about doing because it gives them a time to sit down and be like, how does this work? All right, you show me how this works. Okay, so which part goes here? Oh, you're putting a lot of effort into that. Oh, that was tricky. How did you figure that one out? And really practicing that phrase, the strategic phrase, the, the, the process-oriented phrase, instead of sitting down and doing those math, which is a trigger. Okay, so finding the thing that is helpful and motivating and motivating to the child and setting goals for that. And when your kid comes home from school and they're upset and they're having a hard time, that's a motivator, right? So right now I have a, a coping skill. I can work on my model cards. And I can sit down with my parent and I can have some time together and we can kind of, you can subliminally give them the growth method and growth mindset information that might then bleed into those other areas. If we are able to practice things more calm, including growth mindset, changing our mindset, being persevering, being resilient in times of struggle, we practice them more calm, we're going to be more likely to be able to do them when we're slightly upset. Okay? Um, convey that there is no test. I've talked a good bit about this. I just mean that at home, there may be tests at school, but at home, we're learning. Okay? We're learning. It's a constant learn. There is no test. There is no end result. It's a learn. Okay? Teach your kids to advocate for their needs. This is largely, in this age group, we're thinking 0 to 12, asking for help and accessing help. Okay? So helping them think about, what is the strategy here? If I really don't know what to do, then my strategy is finding someone who does and asking for help. I'm praising that strategy. Be careful about too much support. So again, in that zone of proximal development, does my child need me to stand over them while they do the easy math sheet? Probably not. Okay? Making sure that you monitor your level of support and stepping in when you know your child absolutely needs it. Okay? So monitoring that, that 
that frustration tolerance and knowing when to step in and when to kind of back off and see if they can manage the frustration at this point. Okay? And then maintain the change. Like I said, it's easy to get triggered. And so frequently people will stop practicing something when they feel they've gotten good at it. Okay? Right? It happens all the time. You, get, you work at something, you work at something, you work at something, and you get it and you stop practicing. So we usually have to pull ourselves back into a growth mindset. CBT and growth mindset. Cognitive behavioral therapy is an intervention that we use in depression, anxiety, um, <coughs> many different kinds of disorders. And what it means is that there is a brain that interprets the events that are happening and influences your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. Okay? So your brain, of course, someone walks into the room and yells something mean at me. Okay? Your brain would interpret this information. You would have thoughts about what just happened. You'd have feelings. You'd have actions. Okay? This cognitive triad is the whole basis of cognitive behavioral therapy. Thoughts, feelings, actions. I draw this with kids I work with because it's helpful for them to understand that there's this back and forth relationship with it. Your thoughts influence your feelings, your feelings influence your actions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mindset gives us the color and shape of our thoughts that pop into our head, right? So if I have a fixed mindset and I come upon a problem that I don't know, so the thought that pops into my head is, this. Okay? And the feeling is frustration, upset, sadness, anger. Okay? And the action is I give up. I walk away, put my head down, I leave the room, cry. Okay? If the thought is, if I have a growth mindset, if someone gives me a hard problem, the thought is, huh, I don't know how to do this, but I think if I work at it, I might be able to, or I can ask for help. Hmm. Then the feeling is, eh, kind of neutral. A little bit challenged, a little bit frustrated, but still kind of a persistent undertone. And the action is you ask for help, you work at it. Okay? So mindset colors those thoughts that pop into our heads. We frequently have anxious kids, okay, depressed kids, kids who have ADHD, who understand cognitive behavioral therapy. If we're able to help them build a growth mindset, okay, through what we were talking about a little bit just a second ago. And then we're helping give information that will color those thoughts, okay? Um, and that will help make cognitive behavioral therapy easier. It'll help them change their thoughts easier because the goal of cognitive behavioral therapy is, is cognitive restructuring, we change your thoughts. And so we're help coloring their thoughts with growth mindset, with a fixed mindset. Then we're helping to change those thoughts. One of the things that they kind of leave out of growth mindset that I put into here because I think it's like everything hinges on it, is growth mindset won't work if your kid is melting down, right? So no matter how much I think that like we're all gonna just, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be fantastic, just grow, it's gonna be great. If your kid is melting down and they don't have coping skills to handle the frustration that happens whenever you're doing hard things, then you're not gonna be able to make any changes, okay? So coping skills are a necessary part of this process. It's kind of left out of these books that I have up here, okay? You have to have coping skills, behaviors, thoughts, and emotions that we use to adjust to life. And there's three different kinds of coping skills, problem-focused, emotion-focused, and appraisal-focused. Problem-focused means you work on trying to figure out the problem. Okay, so my coping skill is I've got a problem and I've got to think to myself, what am I going to do about this problem? Okay, it's a distressing problem. What am I going to do about it? Emotion-focused is I have a problem and I'm really upset and I have to regulate the emotions so that I can be effective. Okay, and appraisal focus is changing the way you think about it so that you don't have control over the problem. Say the problem is bigger than you, you don't have control over it, you may have to change the way you think to find things that you are in control of. Okay? So coping skills, for this one in particular, for growth mindset, I think this emotion-focused coping skill is more helpful because we're usually dealing with frustration. Okay, we're usually dealing with a frustrated child, an angry child, a mad child who's pushing back on problems. Okay? So we're gonna work on these emotion focused for a second. And this is useful in this meltdown cycle. Okay, so this is an actual thing, okay? There's a meltdown cycle, and what it means is usually at the baseline is where everyone's calm. <laughs> We're all calm here, it's all good. This is where you learn things, down here at the baseline. Coping skills cannot be built up here. No one learns anything new when they're melting down. However, whenever someone's melting down, we frequently say, why don't you take a deep breath? 
why don't you calm down? Okay? <laughs> oh, it's not going to work. Okay? So that's just not something that happens or works out very well. Um, even if you're going to a therapist, even if you're working on these things, unless it is a well ingrained coping skill that she was able to do it independently without prompting, no matter what, I would never bring it up up there. Okay? That's so not at all. Okay? Meltdowns, there's rarely anything that you can do with meltdowns except for step back and give it time. Okay? And wait for the person to come back down to here and then you can process. Okay? Then we can process how we talk about coping. So we work on coping skills every day when calm. Okay? And so this is one of those things Megan, um, one of the psychologists Megan Barlow and I were talking about this. She said, you know, it's hard though. You've got to be sneaky. You gotta be sneaky with the coping skills because the kid's not gonna be like, so yeah, totally, we're gonna take these three deep breaths right now. Let's get sit down and do some Zen meditation. Sure. Okay? Not gonna happen. You gotta be sneaky about it. So we'll talk about that in a second. When we notice, so if we're doing thinking about growth mindset, if we notice a kid working on a problem, if we notice a kid who's trying something new and they're getting frustrated with it. This rumbling stage is where you start to see some of those signs of frustration like kicking or pacing or rocking or starting to talk to yourself about things that you're mad about. For my nine-year-old, it's pulling on his hair and that kind of stuff, okay? And so when we see that rumbling, so when we can kind of step in, we first see the sign of it and say, you know what, it looks like you're having some trouble. It looks like you're frustrated. This is another important piece, labeling emotions, okay? Usually in growth mindset, we have difficulty with kids understanding what their emotions are. All right, so you'll see frustration when a kid doesn't know that they're being frustrated. All right, I'm upset is usually the word that you hear. And the reason why I pick a part in the language that sounds like semantics is because frustration tells you there's things that's standing in your way you can work on. Upset is just a vague upset emotion. I'm upset, I don't know why, who knows. But if I'm frustrated, there's something in my way that I can work on. Right? So it's important to label emotions and what they are. Frustrated, angry, sad, lonely. <coughs> Labeling emotions is important. Okay? So you can help label. Seems like you're getting frustrated. Okay? You've been working on this problem for a really long time. Why don't we take a break for a second? So whenever I'm thinking about emotion-focused coping skills, I would say something antiseptic bouncing is one that I love. Okay? So antiseptic bouncing is just a fancy way of saying, go do something really quickly and come back. All right, you guys probably all do this all the time, where you say, a kid's upset about something, you start to notice it, and you're like, oh, I really am out of pens. Can you go grab a pen from over there and come back? Right? You send them on a tiny error that has nothing to do with what it is you're doing right now, and then they get up, they're out of the situation for a couple seconds, they get some physical activity for a minute, they have a second to breathe, they come back, and now they're a little bit lower. Okay? And you might be open to some intervention. Easy one to do. Okay? Or alternately, I might, if I'm practicing, I might practice taking breaths myself, okay? I'm getting frustrated, I'm gonna take a deep breath, okay? Uh, one of the things that the kids will do with me, one of my effective mindfulness ones that I do, is walking and breathing. Isn't that ridiculous, okay? So, walking and breathing, just breathing, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, okay? And so you count your steps and you breathe through your feet. And so it gets, Movement, it gets motion, you're away from the situation, you're walking and breathing, and that gives you a second to be away from whatever it is that's bothering you. And what you're doing in that second is having a child step away from something, come back and persist. Step away, come back and persist. When you're frustrated, you probably don't sit think to yourself, I'm just gonna sit here and power through this. You might go get a cup of coffee. You might go get a snack. You might stand up and talk to a coworker. You might go do an air drill, but come back to it. That's okay, that's acceptable. That builds your resilience, it builds your perseverance, okay? A sneakier way of doing it, mints and lollipops. Mints are one of these weird <laughs> things that can really help a kid calm down. Right? The most anxious kid I ever worked with came running into the building. Um, he did not want to be there. His mom came in, he was staying in the car. His mom came in and said, I'm, I'm just gonna, we're not gonna come in. Um, and I said, why don't you just fill out some paperwork? And the, and the kid came running in, he's about 13 years old, first time just years ago now. He came running and said, you said we weren't going to stay. And he was like shaking with anxiety. He was so mad to be there, okay? And I happened to have a lollipop in my pocket from doing a little kid group. And I was like, do you want this? And he took it, and he sucked on it, and he sat down, and you could just see him go. For whatever reason, mint lollipops, that physical sensation of sucking on something, can be really helpful in just de-escalation for a second. Okay? He didn't 
day, they left, they came back, but he came back the next time, okay? And the goal wasn't to get him to come back. The goal was to get him to persevere, right? To be resilient to this anxiety, to not avoid it, right? So we don't want to avoid the anxiety. We want to keep coming back. We want to keep facing the thing we're afraid of. Fidgets can be helpful. It's a distraction. It's something to kind of distract you for a couple of minutes with a time limit, okay? Appropriate use of fidgets as a distraction in terms of a coping skill is useful. Long-term use of fidgets sometimes for some kids can be pretty distracting for them. So just knowing your own child and the way that it works, okay? Taking a specific break for a specified time. Again, being able to step away and come back. These are coping skills. People frequently look for like fancy coping skills. Your best coping skill is the thing your kid already does, okay? So if your kid already stands up and walks away for a second, then stand up, prompt them to stand up, walk away, and come back. Okay? Um, activities, remember be sneaky, reading books, watching shows, listening to songs. These slumberkins are pretty good up here. There's different growth mindset books here. The reason I like these is because they're aimed towards it's probably pretty pay from second grade, but it has little mantras at the end. So there's still that age where you might be reading to a kid when they're going to bed, okay? And so you can just sneak it, right? So sneak it in. And it's a story about how alpacas carry things and alpacas can carry your stress. And it has at the end a little mantra, I am strong and supported, I am never alone, climb these mountains will lead me home. And so it's super cute and it's nice as a bedtime story, okay? But it's sneaking in little mantras that will help them change the way that they're thinking, okay? So there's different kind of ones. Um, brain maps for some of our older kids. I do this with my own kids, um, particularly my nine-year-old. I introduced it when he was younger and had a, a lower frustration tolerance. Um, a brain map is just a picture of a brain. You can just print out a picture of a brain. I think there's one in this one. And so there's an example of what it looks like in here. Um, you print out a picture of a brain, and every time the child learns a new thing, you put a line on it to signify that connection. Okay, so you put a little line on it. And you write under it, um, say your kid's learning how to cite words, and they really master the. Okay, so you put a little line put the on it, okay? And the next day, they read it again. You make the line a little thicker, okay? Every time they learn something new, you're making little lines, okay? And every time they get stronger and they make a mistake and they build their skill with it, you make the line stronger. So it's visual, right? So it's a visual representation of the things that they're learning. Um, we want to keep an eye out for opportunities to encourage growth, set goals with your kid and help them meet that goal. Um, engaged activities, modeling. So things that are just outside of your own comfort zone. So if you are someone who doesn't like to do outdoor stuff, doing something outdoorsy and talking about how you're making progress and how you're building something and making yourself stronger in that area is good. And then building coping skills, practicing coping skills when they're calm in sneaky ways. So these are some quotes um, for parenting that are helpful. Um, of course we know yet. Uh, the, I love this one. Comparison is the thief of joy. So when I say these are quotes for parenting, these are things that I consider for myself. All right, they're not things that I tell my kids. All right, this helps me push myself into a growth mindset. If I'm comparing my kid to someone else, then I'm feeling sad. Okay, because there's always going to be someone who's doing something better than my kid. Okay, even if my kid's the top of the class, there's always going to be someone better. So pro valuing him where he is is helpful to me. Remember the oak tree inside the acorn? I love this one. I don't know where I said it. I don't remember where I read it, but I like it, okay? Because it's important to think about, we get lost in the day-to-day -day of parenting, we get lost in every day of it. And so it's important to think about when this kid breaks home a B minus that you're not like, oh, what's important, that B minus, or the adult who's going to remember my reaction to this B minus, okay? And helping him move forward. Um, the impediment to action advances action was standing in the way becomes the way. I like this one from my three-year-old, my one who has struggles, because what it means is there's no way other than the way we're doing it. There's, we're, oh, sorry, there's no way other than the way we're doing it right now. It can only be this way. He can only have these struggles and we only have to push through them. That's what happens. Okay? You may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. This applies in so many different areas of, of parenting kids who struggle. Learning isn't a way of reaching one's potential, but rather a way of developing it. Potential is a weird word. I don't know my potential. No one here knows their potential. We throw it around like someone knows it, like there's some measure of it somewhere, okay? Learning isn't a way of reaching it, it's a way of developing it. There isn't a fixed potential. We have to work towards it, okay? Whatever that is, okay? Um, so, 
We're going to do some questions, but first I want to do a, a couple scenarios so you guys can apply some of the things that we're talking about. Okay? It's written in a Word document, I swear it's written in a Word document. I'm just checking my phone. Okay. So this one's about my nine year old in a scenario I already told you guys about, so we'll go with this one. Okay. Your nine year old comes straight off the bus and starts whining like he's going to be mine on his math test that day. You're making a birthday cake for his sibling. Okay, so this happened about a week ago. Um, and you initially turn and look at him and say, okay, okay, because he comes in like, I'm not being mine. And I was like, okay. Because um, I'm trying to think about how I'm going to respond to him. Because he's talking in a way that means, like, that's leading to me to think there's like more to this or it's going somewhere. There's more than what's going on right now. So I'm like, not sure how to react at this moment. Okay. Um, he then starts launching into a tirade about how he only wanted to get A's this semester, and now that he has to be minus, there's no way he's going to get an A because the quarter's over in a week and things like that. Okay? And he's like throwing himself around the kitchen while he's doing this, you know, like rolling on things and whatever. It's very dramatic. Um, so he's getting increasingly agitated at this point. And I'm not really involved, right? So I'm just witnessing what's happening, okay? I'm just standing there, all right? Um, I'm trying hard to help him move away from getting grades as a judgment of his abilities, which we are at this point. We're trying, I'm trying really hard to move him there because no we are now, but I'm trying hard. So I have to think. So first off, from step one, what are the basic variables that I need to think about in this scenario? Okay, the things I just told you about. He just came off the bus. He's whining about his grades, things like that. <coughs> Before I start launching into any kind of responses, what is something that I need to consider? Uh-huh, there we go. Basic needs, right? Are you hungry? He just came walking in the door. So you know what's up, all right? We all know what's up. Is this kid hungry? Tired. Does he need to go to the bathroom? Is he not? Is he tired? Okay? Does he just spent all day at school? He's nine, so he's growing, he eats everything, okay? So I'm like, all right, so I need to think about is he hungry, is he tired? Um, do I think now's a good time to have this conversation? No, right? So those are the things I'm thinking about. What are the basic needs? Do I need to talk about this right now? Probably not, okay? Um, and then he's also having some aspects with the math lesson. So I kind of have an idea, like, he was having some difficulties, so I, I would have been surprised if he got an A on this one, all right? But he's not used to this, eh? he's one of those math and buffs, so, okay. So what are some things that I can do based on these thoughts that I just have, things I consider? Tired, hungry, Things like that. Yeah. Right? So getting him a snack. I'm also baking a birthday cake, and my nine-year-old loves to help. So I'm just standing there, my six-year-old, who turned seven, wanted a Kit Kat birthday cake. Which was crazy, okay? So I'm like breaking Kit Kats apart and sticking them around, which is actually very easy. Uh, it sticks to the icing. So I'm sticking them around, and I'm like, why don't you come eat a Kit Kat? I know, it's not a healthy snack, but whatever. Okay, so he comes over and he's eating Kit Kats and he starts helping me put them on and then we put the M&Ms on top of the cake and things like that. And then Dr. Shannon's car, she's probably like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> um, so I have him engaged in this activity, right? So I'm antiseptic bouncing. Thinking back to that, that's an antiseptic bounce. You're gonna get a snack and you're gonna help me with the birthday cake, okay? And so what are some things that I could ask him about? So we're thinking process oriented, right? I need some more information before I start talking to him about this, okay? So what would be some things you would ask him about his B minus on this math test? He's being pretty disappointed, you know? He's being pretty disappointed, right? So that's a good strategy, is just stating, maybe giving him some feedback about some emotions, okay? Um, another a question that I did ask, because I'm trying to figure out what to do with this, is what parts did you get wrong? Okay, what was hard about it, you know? What was hard? And he said, well, I just went too fast. And I said, oh, okay. What did that look like? And he said, well, I just copied a bunch of numbers. Oh, so you went too fast. But it took me all 40 minutes. Okay, so you went too fast, but it took you all 40 minutes. Yeah, I didn't check it. Did you have time to check it? Yes, okay. So, the other thing that like, right, these are conversations you probably have with your kid at home. It's like, where am I going with this, right? So, I'm still putting Kit Kats around the birthday cake. So, we're doing a neutral activity at this point, right? So, we're doing something that is not escalating. He's able to talk to him because he's not focused on anyone. Sitting down, staring at the paper, we're having a conversation, okay? I'm genuinely trying to be involved in the process of learning here. 
right? I want to know what the mistakes are. So then I say, all right, so we're kind of back and forth. I didn't check my work. Out, out, out. And I said, the other day you were having some trouble with some of the math work. You know, you said you couldn't get it done on the bus. I said, yeah. I said, what will we do different for next time? I said, maybe I can start doing my math homework at home. Yeah, I think maybe we can try that. <laughs> okay? And now he is. He's doing comes home, he does his sits down, does his math homework, and I'm like, I really like how you're doing that at home. Do you think it's getting easier for you to do? He's like, yeah, it's too noisy. <laughs> okay, right? So that's kind of how you use a growth mindset, is taking the information so it doesn't just always come out of your mouth and you're going to um, encourage the effort or the process or whatever it is. Okay? You're going to find out information. You're going to address the basic needs. You're going to use some coping skills. You're going to dig a little bit deeper with failures involved and try to figure out what needs to change. What's the strategy that needs to change? We need to be open to the process of learning for ourselves as well, okay? And not just launch into the idea that we already know what you did wrong. Three years ago, I probably would have been like, you were rushing, weren't you? <laughs> you were rushing, yep. okay? And that's not me being invested in the process of learning. That's me being invested in the outcome. Okay? And that's okay. Don't judge yourself for it. Just try to change it a little bit. <laughs> okay? All right. So, why don't we do some questions? A parent asks, how do you praise a child for their successes while at the same time encourage growth mindset in things that they may be struggling in? So, thinking about the different types of praise. Right? So, the effort praise, the strategy praise, the perseverance. Okay? And so, if she does do well, I would say, huh, you got all these right. What would you do differently this time? So I'm imagining she's probably not done well on the spelling tests in the past. Well, this is actually more fun. So I would I would think about the different types of praise that you can use. So instead of using that blanket praise, of, oh my gosh, this is fantastic, oh great, this is so wonderful, this is great, because you want her to feel good about having done something well. Right. Sit down and be like, you got all these right. What did they do with the problem? They had, what did you do? Okay, well, and have her talk through it. Well, we studied them. Did you study them? Yeah. Okay, so you studied them. So what did you yeah. do? We studied them. Okay, so you put forth some good effort. Okay, how did you take the test? Like, what was the test like? Tell me about the test. Okay, so you studied, you worked really hard, and you got a result. That, are you happy with the result? Fantastic. I'm happy with the result. This is a good day. Okay, so you don't have to minimize success. Right. Just frame it as we put forth work on this. It's not just something that happened. So growth mindset doesn't want you to think that you just succeeded because you just did it. Right. You succeeded because you did all of these things. And that success, that process is meant to be celebrated. Okay. And not so much the outcome. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's helpful. Okay. Yeah. How do you balance team for rewards in a growth mindset kind of frame of mind? And that's an interesting one because there's it depends on your child. Some kids absolutely need a sticker chart. Some kids absolutely need a behavior chart that kind of moves through to, to move through their day. You know, there are some kids who don't need that. In which case, we're putting them into an external reinforcer that's something already internally motivating for them. And so it depends on where your child falls. But if, you're, if there is a sticker chart and the child does well, okay. So say your kid's always on green at school or whatever it is. Ask about that success. So what did you do today that got you green? What did you do today that earned these things? And so if they are Say you have a sticker chart that's geared towards behavior, and your kid is working towards a particular, they demonstrate so many behaviors, they get a reinforcer. I would absolutely reinforce every time, my goodness, you are trying so hard. I know that we made this chart because it's a hard thing for you to do this. And look at you, you're earning these stickers, you're demonstrating behaviors, you're doing it, so turning it internally, turning it towards the work, turning it towards the effort and resilience, okay? Does that make sense? So, and so they can coexist, but taking it away from working towards that external motivator and using it as, my goodness, this is a monitoring of your progress. This is amazing. It's almost thinking about that brain map and how we keep coloring it. It's the same kind of thing, you know? Like we're tracking progress here. Okay, yeah. A mom asks, how do you encourage a growth mindset when a child comes home from school and needs a break and doesn't want to do their homework? And so I think you're kind of hitting on a problem that a lot of people have, yeah. is that kids can hold it together in school, and then they get home and they can't hold it together anymore. And so there's a, an analogy I have about a full cup, okay? And so every day you go to school and something happens that's like a little bit upsetting and your cup gets a little bit fuller. 
and then something else happens, like say the kid behind you kicks you in line, mm -hmm. and then your your the kid next to you won't stop talking even though you ask them to, and then your teacher gives you a worksheet that you didn't expect, you don't quite know how to do, and so you come home, and you're right at the top, and then you come home and you just dump it out because these are the people that you feel safe around. Okay, and so this is where coping skills can come in as well as. Yes. It so seems like you know how to do them. Yeah. But then that all goes out the window. Mm -hmm. the minute it's going to switch. Yes. Yes. I'm not doing that. And so I would take a step back and I would think to myself, what are my expectations for him at the end of the day when he comes home? What are my expectations for him in terms of sometimes when I'm talking with parents, I'll say we have to put things into priority. Is the priority that he's able to get some work done or is the priority that he's able to get all of his work done? Okay, and the reason why I say it that way is because if we're starting off with a kid melting down and it's hours and hours of battle, then a positive mindset, a happy child, a child who's not stressed, a child who's escalating, <coughs> who's able to use their coping skills, who's getting one worksheet done instead of five, is going to be a better outcome for me. And then we start to increase as the kid gets better coming home and not dumping everything out. So one of the things I would think about is I would talk to the school a little bit about maybe giving me. Well, there's a couple different things that I would do. In terms of a growth mindset way, I would think about what are my goals, okay? What is the goal for this child? So thinking about the setting the incremental goals, okay? I would think about sneaking in coping skills in a sneaky way. So having them come home do something that they enjoy doing for a period of time. Um, whether it's Legos, whether it's coloring, I wouldn't turn on screens because that can cause a battle um, in terms of like getting off the screen. Um, so I would pick some of those things that they bouncing techniques, you know, and have them do something that they enjoy, have them do something that's fun and exciting um, for about a half an hour. I would introduce one worksheet of homework, set a timer, we're going to work on this for 15 minutes, what we get done in 15 minutes, what we get done, and then I would end it for that day. I would let the teachers know they're going to be doing this. Um, and I would give a lot of praise about the process. You're trying really hard right now. You really held it together. You really um, are persisting with this. You came and you sat down so nicely. What did we do different today? What did we do different today? Well, today you came home and we did this particular thing. And then we sat down and we did 15 minutes of homework. And now we're taking a break. Okay? And so walking through the process, walking through um, the strategies for coping, as well as thinking about what is your goal for your child getting through the day. Does that make sense? Yeah. A mom asks, how do I get my child to engage in activities where he isn't the best at something? Yeah, I would take a step back and think about it yeah. from, we have this behavior, Yeah. okay? So the behavior is refusal. And the feeling underneath it is fear. So that's something like, that's what I'm trying to, like, I would yeah. walk you through that, is thinking about the <coughs> this behavior, what's the feeling underneath it, and then what's the need? So I would imagine, I'm just like hypothesizing that he's afraid of failure, so he has this where basically he doesn't want to do anything, so fear, uh, fear of failure, and then the need underneath it being that he does not, he hasn't developed resiliency, he hasn't developed perseverance, he hasn't developed any kind of stick to itiveness to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do this thing that doesn't have a win or lose to it. So I try to take away the winning or the losing or the best or the worst, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and I might start with, it could be as simple as going to like Home Depot and building one of those, like those shops or whatever it is. So we're all doing something new. And then we're going to work with so trying to put growth mindset into those situations that are very neutral. Okay? And then building up his resilience, his tolerance for frustration in situations where you're learning how to use hammers and nails. You're learning how to glue things together. You're learning how to do these things that you've never done before. So you're probably not going to be that great at it. But our kid doesn't know to value that. You know what I mean to a certain extent? Is that it's kind of a, a completely neutral thing. You don't have any real experience with it prior. And so putting it in there. So um, one of the things I did with my nine-year-old was fishing. He's never fished before. And that was like, I jumped into it. I was like, hey, let's do this. It'll be fun. Because Avon has like a free fishing thing during the summer. And he had to seriously sit and deal with the, the frustration of something not biting his, something biting his brother's yeah. hook, something biting <laughs> my hook. And it was a lot of that perseverance of pushing through. I'm like, this is part of the process. This is what we do. We're sitting with it in those situations. Prompting coping skills during it. Okay, so if you're there with him, you're not quite with him when he's sitting baseball, you're not there when he's with, with football. You can do the growth mindset praising and the aesthetic bouncing and monitoring the coping skills to keep him coming back to the situation. And so if you have some control over what the um, activity is, and you're thinking of visual activity, then you're able to kind of give that feedback and that praise in a more neutral situation where he doesn't feel like he needs to be the best at whatever it is that's coming, because there's no best 
bird house maker. Right. There's no vets, you know, things like that. Okay? Yeah. Um, so trying to find those kind of activities might be helpful. One more question. Yeah. A mom says that her child refuses to do things at home that they know she knows how to do. So how do you incorporate growth mindset in a situation like this? And so I would take a step back and I would think to myself, all right, so I know my child knows particular skills, or I think my child has particular skills, and I'm teaching her to use them. I would like her to use them more consistently. I think that's what I'm hearing say, and do them independently, okay? Um, from a growth mindset perspective, there would be something kind of standing in the way for her, whether it's fear of failure or fear of other people, like not, maybe she loves the intention of it, maybe she loves the help, maybe she doesn't like the experience of being on the spot, maybe she loves her, whatever the maybe is, trying to help figure that out for her and identifying the safe spaces. So if it's reading, sitting down and saying, here's our goal. You're gonna read this sentence. I'm going to read the next sentence. You're going to read this sentence. I'm going to read the next sentence. Okay? And then when you read these three words, so as a little kid reader, you know, it's like the ball is red. Okay? So you're going to read those three words. Then I'm going to read the next sentence. And when they read that sentence, you're going to say, to them, my goodness, you did that so well. You were able to read those four words. And before you couldn't read them, so you must have been thinking about them really hard. You must have learned them pretty well. Um, you read them. Um, you worked. So strategy, what was your strategy with this? Okay, so what did you, how did you read them? Did you sound them out? Did you read this word elsewhere at school? And it's really focusing on praising the actual aspect of participation, okay? The point to praise for her isn't that she can demonstrate knowledge, but that she's participating with you in a particular aspect. So shifting it from knowledge demonstration to just participation in the activity um, would be where I would focus more of that growth. 